Welcome to the machine learning course. Uh, today is the first week of the course. We will be talking about a brief overview of machine learning. Uh, if my voice is not clear or if you have any problem uh, hearing me or understanding me, please just hit me back so I can uh, correct myself. So my name is Amra Bashevsky and uh, you can use both of these email addresses if you want to contact me. I would prefer actually Gmail. And uh, right now I'm currently working on uh, image processing and I am the image and video processing group leader at Havasan since 2010. I got my uh, degree from Middlesex Technical University 2003, then I got my uh, master's degree from Middlesex Technical University as well. Outline uh, of our course for this week. We will have a brief introduction of machine learning. We will see what machine learning is and we will have some definitions. What is artificial intelligence? What is data science? What is machine learning? We will have some uh, history and we will check some milestones for the machine learning and artificial intelligence. Then we will be seeing the required theoretical background to become a machine learning expert or to become familiar with artificial intelligence. Then, uh, we will discuss what are the required applied skills to become a machine learning uh, expert or to become familiar with artificial intelligence. And then we will see some applications from uh, industry and academia. Uh, and then we will talk about the course content at the end of the uh, lecture. <coughs> so this is basically our curriculum. We have 14 weeks. That's going to be a dance. We have 14 weeks and that's going to be a dance lecture, as I said, with both homeworks, quizzes uh, and applied hands-on training. At the end of the course, we will be covering almost everything about artificial intelligence that you need to know uh, to study further the artificial intelligence for your uh, Master of Science uh, or PhD thesis. So artificial intelligence enables machines to think and as you see from this image artificial intelligence is the big circle then we have machine learning which is the combination of statistical tools and there is deep learning which is a subset of machine learning this is an important picture indeed so artificial intelligence covers almost everything and there is the data science which has a little bump here we will see why there is a bump here and uh, what is the difference between data science and artificial intelligence and our course is machine learning which means actually we will cover uh, some stuff about deep learning but our lecture will be mostly on statistics and mathematics which is which are the combination of statistical tools to explore the data so this was our course curriculum. As you see, we have 10 weeks for machine learning. We will uh, discuss the mathematical tools. And then we will have four weeks of deep learning. We might switch uh, one or two actually. But then at the end of the course, we will both cover machine learning as well as deep learning. Okay, so what is actually artificial intelligence? I will use some uh, videos you have the links uh, you can watch them later on from youtube uh, let me just know if you cannot hear because there is voice uh, with the videos the artificial intelligence is, is there any problem? Help machines and computers mimic no. human we can hear okay fine behavior It's like a Russian nesting doll. Artificial intelligence at the highest level is the device being smart. How it becomes smart under the hood then is the next layer of machine learning, which are the general techniques or a variety of techniques. So artificial intelligence deals with a machine being smart. And machine learning actually deals with the tools, mathematical and statistical tools to make the machine smart are used to make that device smart and then there's a further subset of algorithms or techniques called deep learning artificial intelligence is 
going to be used in everything. So I'll give you two examples. If a car has a intelligence built in, if it can see the world, so looking at what's on the road, looking at you as the driver, and being able to anticipate and course correct when something goes wrong, something jumps into the road. So actually, let's say this car is our device. And if we want to call this car or the device intelligent, we need some sensors to collect data. For example, here we have the tire pressure sensor. We might have a camera, for example. And let's say if our car is intelligent, then it should be able to automatically tell us whether the tire pressure is not okay or there is a dark, for example, passing from the street. So if the car is able to do this automatically, then the car is intelligent. Autonomous vehicles of any kind are not going to be autonomous without artificial intelligence. Uh, in the medical field, new treatments that'll come from the analysis of reams of data to detect cancers and diseases. Today, machines are smart, and they're smart because of AI. But AI still has a dependency on us, people. We're making it possible. The next phase is when artificial intelligence... So right now, we are discussing uh, how artificial intelligence happens. Currently, actually, there are quite a few studies uh, to make the machines more intelligent and to make them intelligent by themselves. So right now we program the machines. We don't program them explicitly. That's one thing about artificial intelligence. You don't program a machine to do something specifically. You just tell some rules and the machine obeys the rules and sometimes some behavior not. But anyhow, that's programming the machine. Um, what we are trying uh, as a data scientist or artificial intelligence ex experts, we are trying the machines to program themselves. So that's going to be the next phase of artificial intelligence. This is able to walk on its own. Companies like Qualcomm, if we do our jobs right, and if artificial intelligence is done right, the actual implementation is totally transparent to a consumer. But what they end up with is devices in their world that are more than utilities. They're actually experiential and they will make your life easier, more exciting. This is truly a transformational technology. It's that big. So the thing is, as AI experts, we would like to make the machines a part of our life. So they're just not going to be devices, but they're going to be intelligent devices as part of our life. That's the aim of artificial intelligence. Okay, so we actually understood artificial intelligence, I assume. Uh, so we would like to make a machine intelligent. Then what is machine learning? Machine learning algorithms build a mathematical model of sample data, known as training data, in order to make predictions or decisions without being explicitly programmed to perform the task. So there are two important things here and they're both, as you see, we build a mathematical model with machine learning algorithms and we program a machine without being explicit about the performed task. So that's basically the difference between machine learning and artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is covering machine learning. It's just any way to make a machine intelligent, but machine learning is the mathematical and statistical tools to make a machine intelligent. So there is actually a good history of artificial intelligence. Uh, let's watch a video about that and we will be discussing that history. While everyone seems to be talking about artificial intelligence these days, it's good to remember that this is not something new. In 1950, Alan Turing proposed the Turing test. That same year, Isaac Asimov proposed the three laws of robotics. In 19 So it goes back to 1950s, as this video says, but it actually goes back. In 1951, the first AI-based program was written. In 1955, the first self-learning game-playing program was created. In 1959, the MIT AI Lab is set up. In 1961, the first robot is introduced into GM's assembly line. 1964 saw the first demo of an AI program which understands natural language. In 1965, the first chatbot, Eliza, was invented. In 1974, the first autonomous vehicle is created at Stanford AI Lab. 
so that's 1974 and that's somehow autonomous vehicle and up until this date actually most of the stuff uh, is mostly about either natural language processing uh, what we call as NLP to understand human uh, language or about game playing but here people start to do other stuff with other sensors in 1989, Carnegie Mellon creates the first autonomous vehicle using a neural network. In 1997, IBM Deep Blue beats Garry Kasparov at chess. In 1999, Sony introduces IBO. That same year, the MIT AI Lab's first emotional AI is demonstrated. In 2004, DARPA introduces the first autonomous vehicle challenge. In 2009, Google starts building a self-driving. So <clears throat> I remember the 2004 DARPA challenge, for example, quite a few cars, uh, quite a few companies and universities attended this challenge. During the first challenge, as far as I remember, no one could complete the full road. But after one year, people could be able to develop a lot of algorithms in order to take that challenge and most of the cars could make it. So the artificial intelligence research is quite challenging, but it's going quite fast. Car. In 2010, Narrative Sciences AI demonstrates the ability to write reports. In 2011, IBM Watson beats Jeopardy! champions. That same year, Siri, Google Now, and Cortana become mainstream. In 2015, Elon Musk and others announce a $1 billion donation to open AI. In 2016, Google's DeepMind defeats Korean AlphaGo champion. In 2016, Stanford issues the AI 100 report. In 2016, UC Berkeley launches the Center for Human Compatible Artificial Intelligence. At so that's not it, actually. Uh, the video is just until 2016 but there is quite some research after that and most probably you heard about chat gpt and uh, dali the generative networks and we will be seeing some examples of that networks as well as you see the history goes back till 80s uh, and 50s actually excuse me and uh that's basically one slide to summarize what you have seen. And people actually believe the research of artificial intelligence, at least the mathematical and statistical tools go back to the 16th uh, century. Uh, the first mechanical calculator, for example, was built by the uh, French mathematician. And then actually we have Alan Turing. And in between there is quite some research, both on mathematics and statistics. So let's see what actually Alan Turing did. Uh, there is a Turing test, which is actually called the imitation game. We have a human observer and the task is there is one computer and there is another human. But the human observer, which is denoted as the C, cannot see which one is the computer and which one is uh, a human. And the observer give both the computer and the uh, human a task and receive the message as a text so he doesn't know uh, whether the text is generated by a computer or by a human and the Turing test states if the observer cannot identify whether the text is coming from a computer or from a human then this machine can be called or declared as intelligent machine. So that's basically the Turing test. And that's why people think artificial intelligence actually started with uh, Alan Turing, which may or may not be correct. That's uh, not the issue, but uh, his main proposition is actually this uh, imitation game test or what's called as the Turing test. So we will be seeing some uh, examples of artificial intelligence. Everyone is talking about artificial intelligence today. 
But what is it? How and when is it going to have an impact in our lives? Artificial intelligence, or AI for short, is a branch of computer science. It deals with the stimulation of intelligent Would you please turn up computers. the volume a little bit higher? Sure. AI is a suite of... Is it better now? A little bit better, but could be much more. Okay. Technologies where machines automatically learn and adapt to a specific environment. Artificial intelligence is playing a major role in industry, businesses, society, and even in our everyday lives. From deep learning to natural language processing, we interact with AI in one way or another on a daily basis, sometimes without realizing we are doing it. Robots can now take on many of the most repetitive jobs performed by humans with more accuracy and much faster. But robots are not the only ones with embedded AI. So the thing is, people were using robots uh, since 60s, uh, as you have seen from the previous video. The introduction of artificial intelligence to the robotic world means robots can do things that are not specifically programmed. Let's say you have a factory and you have some robots. If the job of the robot is uh, just taking that bin from there and just putting that uh, on top of the table and repeating that process, this is not actually artificial intelligence. But if you can, for example, command the robot to do that task, uh, then that's artificial intelligence because the robot understands you and perform a task which it is not specifically programmed to do. So that's basically the uh, difference between uh, artificially intelligent robots and just programmed robots. So you have seen most probably some factories, especially for car, uh, car factories. There are a lot of uh, robot hands working on some stuff. Yes, they are accurate. They are doing uh, a job much faster than a human, but most of them are not really intelligent. In order to call that robot intelligent, they are supposed to do some work without being specifically said so. AI will let humans switch to more skillful and better jobs. It only requires some training and new skills. But isn't life a constant learning process after all? Humans will be able to work less hours, having more free time to enjoy life, family, hobbies, and friends. Consumer examples of AI today. Amazon's Alexa and Samsung's Bixby, responding to voice command. So that devices can actually respond to voice commands. Most probably all of you. Responding to voice command. Netflix. Recommending programs based on the user's viewing history and preferences. So recommendation systems are uh, a big deal for the artificial intelligence world. So uh, both YouTube, Netflix and other uh, platforms, digital platforms use these recommendation systems. It is being used for uh, shopping sites as well. If you buy something, they recommend you, which might be related with what you have bought or uh, the recommendation system for example for the Netflix recommends you a movie that's quite similar to what you have seen so that's an artificial intelligence or a machine learning problem as well business examples of AI today virtual assistants for responsive customer service machine learning algorithms for better analysis of business performance smart robotics for more efficient supply chains Today, these simple and early examples of AI belong to what we now call narrow AI. Okay, so that's an important issue as well. Narrow AI, and we will see another uh, concept. AI. Narrow AI are systems designed by humans to carry out specific tasks. In the future, data growth, greater computational power, 5G networks, increasingly mature cloud platforms, and more sophisticated software will move AI to the next level. General AI. So we have talked 
about narrow AI and there is this concept of general AI. With the narrow AI, we program uh, not specifically, but we teach some stuff to the robots or uh, a machine and the machine performs some stuff. Sometimes some behavior may not, but with the general AI, you don't program the machine. You just tell the task to be solved and uh, the general AI solves the problem. But not so fast. Before we get there, there are challenges to overcome. Concerns over data, system bias, and security top the list. Let's have a look at some facts. AI market is projected to reach 70 billion by 2020. So that's an old video that, uh, that market is much bigger right now. AI is going to have a transformative effect on consumers enterprises and governments in the near future. AI is going to impact our lives in an unimaginable way. Nearly eight in 10 leading CIOs, CTOs, and heads of IT agree that AI will have a transformative impact on their organization over the next three to five years. For 54% of business leaders, the primary aim of deploying AI is to free staff for higher value work. 65% of business leaders today are considering or piloting AI projects. It will take three to five years for those AI projects to become a reality. It Most of the projects actually became reality. We will be talking about and working on ChatGPT, for example, today. And we will see ChatGPT can write essays. It can summarize you uh, some text. It can even write code. So. People are now concerned whether they will be losing their jobs because ChatGPT or some artificial intelligence can do most of the work they do and uh, the artificial intelligence is sometimes doing the stuff much more uh, productive, faster and in a much better way. So people are right now concerned, especially for the programmers are concerned that they will lose their jobs against artificial intelligence. We will see some examples and we will see why people are concerned. Means there is enough time to learn new skills and be ready for 2024. The global AI market is forecast to reach a valuation of over 3 trillion by 2024. But before that happens, there is plenty we have to learn before we can co-live and co-work with AI. So that's an important concept co-work and co-live with artificial intelligence. Uh, after today's lecture, you will realize you can actually use artificial intelligence in your daily life uh, in a much more efficient way. For example, if you, if you are going to make your homework, for example, or if you are going to write an essay, you can just write it with an artificial intelligence. You can ask artificial intelligence about the outline of your essay and then you can fill it. And that's much, much more efficient than uh, classical way of doing stuff. So we need to find a way to co-work with artificial intelligence and we need to find a way to co-live with artificial intelligence. Co-work with AI. Okay, any questions up until now? So we have uh, another video about everyday applications of artificial intelligence. capabilities as well. We have intelligent email categorization. For example, in Google, we have three categories, the primary, uh, the social, and uh, there's other stuff. So that's intelligent email categorization that's done by artificial intelligence. And there is smart streaming, what we have seen. Uh, with the Netflix stuff, uh, the artificial intelligence recommends you another movie 
that's similar to what you have seen. There is navigation. Uh, that's what you have, what you see with Google Maps or Yandex uh, Maps. It tells you the shortest path. It tells you the less crowded path. It tells you the fastest path. That's artificial intelligence problem as well. For example, finding the shortest path. That's something you can solve with genetic algorithms. Uh, that's a topic we will be covering uh, in our lecture. assistance uh, which is an increasingly uh, developing technology we have this technology on our uh, phones on our uh, smart TVs as well for example and that's become more and more popular <laughs> such as uh, face recognition or uh, fingerprint recognition systems they are relying on artificial intelligence as well so as you see artificial intelligence is actually almost everywhere okay so so uh, we have seen these applications about the intelligent email categorization, smart streaming, recommendation, navigation, voice assistance, and secure verification. Now let's see more applications of artificial intelligence. So I'm not making uh, it full screen on purpose because people are uh, leaving and entering the class. But I can make it for a while. Let's explore how artificial intelligence is helping our planet and at last benefiting humankind. So at number 10, we have artificial intelligence in artificial creativity. Now, so that's one of the most popular topic uh, right now, artificial creativity. You can ask an artificial intelligence to compose uh, a music, for example, or you can ask an artificial intelligence to create a video or a painting for you. Have you ever wondered what would happen if an artificially intelligent machine tried to create music and art? Here's a short audio clip of a classical piece. So this, so this is composed by OpenAI. This is composed by an artificial intelligence. This short audio was composed by an AI based system called MuseNet. Now, MuseNet is a deep neural network that can generate four minute musical compositions with 10 different instruments and can combine styles from country to Mozart and to the Beatles. MuseNet was not explicitly programmed with an understanding of music, but instead it discovered patterns of harmony, rhythm, and style by learning on its own another creative product of artificial intelligence is a content automation tool called wordsmith wordsmith is a natural language generation platform that can transform your data into insightful narratives tech giants such as yahoo microsoft and tableau are using wordsmith to generate around so that's content creation uh, we will see an example of that uh, during the today's class we will describe something and we will ask an artificial intelligence to create a text for us. So that's called content creation. And this is important because most of uh, providers require some content to publish. And you cannot just uh, create all content by yourself or you cannot expect people to create all the content. So that's an important application as well, content creation. 1.5 billion pieces of content every day. Let's move on to our next field, which is AI in social media. Now, ever since social media has become our identity, we've been generating an immeasurable amount of data through chats, tweets, posts, and so on. And whenever there's an abundance of data, AI and machine learning are always involved. 
In social media platforms like Facebook, artificial intelligence is used for face verification, wherein machine learning and deep learning concepts are used to detect facial features and tag your friends. Deep learning is used to extract every minute detail from an image by using a bunch of deep neural networks. Machine learning algorithms are used to design your feed based on your interests. Another so this is an application of uh, artificial intelligence and social media where it uh, actually uses your face for example for recognition or uh, creates feedback depending on your neural networks machine learning algorithms data. are used to design your feed based on your interests another such example is twitter's ai which is being used to identify hate speech and terroristic language in tweets it makes use of machine learning so that's another application for social media you cannot uh, monitor everything in social media and terrorist groups or uh, some illegal uh, organizations may use social media for communication so for example twitter is using artificial intelligence in order to understand whether a conversation is safe or not that's a big application of artificial intelligence as well deep learning and natural language processing to filter out offensive content according to a recent survey the company discovered and banned 300000 terroristic linked accounts 95% of which were found by non-human artificially intelligent machines moving on to our next field we have ai in chatbots so that's another big field uh, chatbots in artificial intelligence I'm pretty sure you don't have pretty good experience with uh, chatbots. They're not very, very intelligent yet, but with the introduction of chat GPT and more intelligent uh, artificial intelligence, the chatbots are becoming much, much more intelligent. And soon I'm pretty sure they will replace most of the human jobs as chatbots. Now these days, virtual assistants have become a very common technology. Almost every household has a virtual assistant that controls the home. A few examples include Siri, Cortana, which are gaining popularity because of the user experience they provide. Amazon's Echo is an example of how AI can be used to translate human language into desirable actions. This device uses speech recognition and natural language processing to perform a wide range of tasks on your command. It can do more than just play your favorite songs, it can be used to control the devices at your house, book cabs for you, make phone calls, order your favorite food, check the weather conditions, and so on. Another example is a newly released Google's virtual assistant called Google Duplex that has astonished millions of people. Not only can it respond to calls and book appointments for you, it adds a human touch. It uses natural language processing and machine learning algorithms to process human language and perform tasks such as manage your schedule, control your smart home, make reservations, and so on. Next, we have artificial intelligence in autonomous vehicles. For the longest time, self-driving cars have been a buzzword in the AI industry. Okay. So if you remember uh, the history of artificial intelligence, the study about the autonomous vehicles started from uh, early 60s actually but uh, with introduction of tesla cars especially the google uh, self-driving car the autonomous vehicles became much much more uh, robust and right now they are being used in uh, real life traffic actually revolutionized the transportation system Companies like Waymo conducted several test drives in Phoenix before deploying their first AI-based public ride-hailing service. The artificial intelligence system collects data from the vehicle's radar, cameras, GPS, and cloud services to produce control signals that operate the vehicle. Advanced deep learning algorithms can accurately predict what objects in the vehicle's vicinity are likely to do. This makes way more cars much more effective and safer. Another famous example of autonomous vehicles are Tesla's self-driving cars. AI implements computer vision, image detection, and deep learning to build cars that can automatically detect objects and drive around without human intervention. Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, talks a ton about how AI is implemented in Tesla's self-driving cars and autopilot features. 
He quoted that Tesla will have fully self-driving cars ready by the end of the year and a robo-taxi version, one that can ferry passengers without anyone behind the wheel. Tesla's autopilot software goes beyond driving the car where you tell it to go. If you're not in the mood for talking, autopilot will check your calendar and drive you to your scheduled appointment. That sounds pretty amazing. So these are right now real life, as you know, uh, Tesla can drive by itself. Moving on to our next application, we have applications of artificial intelligence in space exploration. So this is one of the most interesting fields in which artificial intelligence is being implemented. Space expeditions and discoveries always require analyzing vast amounts of data. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is the best way to handle and process data of this scale. So after rigorous research, astronomers use artificial intelligence to go through years of data obtained by the Kepler telescope in order to identify a distant eight planet solar system. So that's another application of artificial intelligence. If you have too much data, which you usually have, for example, if you are dealing with image processing or if you are dealing with space exploration, your sensors create so many data that you cannot explore uh, manually. So you need some tools, some mathematical tools in order to get the valuable information out of your data. And that's where you have artificial intelligence, especially this is where you have machine learning. This was accomplished by using AI technology. Artificial intelligence is also being used for NASA's next rover mission to Mars, which is the Mars 2020 rover. The Aegis, which is an AI-based Mars rover, is already on the red planet. The so that's another important application of artificial intelligence. And this is actually a very good example in order to understand the importance of artificial intelligence. So the robot is on Mars. And you cannot specifically tell what to do to the robot because it's a very distant uh, location and you usually don't even have a connection with the robot. Therefore, the robot is supposed to be alive by itself. So you have some basic rules that are set uh, when you send the robot and the robot is supposed to live by itself. So this is basically the definition of artificial intelligence. The robot is supposed to perform its tasks by itself by just using the simple rules we implemented on Earth. The robot is responsible for autonomous targeting of cameras in order to perform investigations on Mars. This proves how far AI has reached. Moving on to our next field, artificial intelligence in the gaming field. Over the past few years, artificial intelligence has become an integral part of the gaming industry. In fact, one of the biggest accomplishments of AI is in the gaming industry. I'm sure all of you have heard of DeepMind's AI-based AlphaGo software. DeepMind's AI-based AlphaGo software, which is known for defeating Lee Sedil, the world champion in the game of Go, is considered to be one of the most significant accomplishments in the field of artificial intelligence. So we have artificial intelligence that can actually play chess or Go. Uh, AlphaGo is one of the very intelligent machines. But we have artificial intelligence for our video games as well. That's a very big industry. Because if you play by yourself, for example, uh, I used to play StarCraft a lot. You need artificial intelligence as your opponent. And if the artificial intelligence plays like a human, that's my much more enjoyable. But if you have preset rules that's applied by the artificial intelligence, then if you play two or three times, then you learn how the artificial intelligence or the uh, artificial program behave. So it's not valuable or it's not enjoyable. So if your artificial intelligence in the gaming industry is good, then your game is much, much, much more better. Shortly after the victory, DeepMind created an advanced version of AlphaGo called the AlphaGo Zero, which in turn defeated AlphaGo in an AI to AI face off. Unlike the original AlphaGo, which DeepMind trained over time by using large quantities of human knowledge and supervision, the advanced system AlphaGo Zero 
taught itself to master the game. So Go is a very complex game actually and it's almost impossible to uh, create a machine that can just use uh, simple rules or preset rules. So you, you really need an artificial intelligence and right now the artificial intelligence can beat another artificial intelligence and they both can beat a, a much better player, human player. So uh, AlphaGo for example is like unbeatable by any human right now. Other examples of AI in gaming include the first encounter assault dragon, which is popularly known as Fear, is basically a first person shooter video game. So what makes this game special? The actions taken by the opponent AI are unpredictable because the game is designed in such a way that the opponents are trained throughout the game and never repeat the same mistakes. So basically they get better as the game gets harder. This makes the game very challenging and prompts the players to constantly switch strategies and never sit in the same position. Moving on to our next application, we have artificial intelligence in banking and finance. We all know that trading mainly. That's a very big industry as well. Artificial intelligence in banking and finance. Actually, right now in most stock markets, we have bots. We have much more bots than humans actually depends on the ability to predict the future accurately. Machines are great at this because they can crunch a huge amount of data in a short span. Machines can also learn to observe patterns in past data and predict how these patterns might repeat in the future. An example of this is Japan's leading brokerage house Nomura Securities which has reluctantly been pursuing one goal that is to analyze the insights of experienced stock traders with the help of computers. So basically, the advantage of an artificial intelligence over a human in stock markets or uh, banking and finance sector is the machines are not emotional and they can act fast. They can analyze a vast amount of data. So they can analyze the past data and then they can predict very precisely what's going to happen in some moment. So uh, they are much, much more better than a human in stock markets. So after years of research, Namura is set to introduce a new stock trading system. The new system stores a vast amount of price and trading data in its computer. By tapping into this database of information, it will make assessments. For example, it may determine that current market conditions are similar to the conditions two weeks ago and predict how share prices will be changing a few minutes down the line. This will help to make better trading decisions based on the predicted market prices. AI in banking is growing faster than you thought. A lot of banks have already adopted artificial intelligence based systems to provide customer support, detect anomalies and credit card frauds. An example of this is HDFC Bank. HDFC Bank has deployed an AI based chatbot called EVA, which stands for Electronic Virtual Assistant. Since its launch, EVA has addressed over 3 million customer queries, interacted with over half a million unique users, and held over a million conversations. EVA can collect knowledge from thousands of sources and provide simple answers in less than 0.4 seconds. Most of the banks in Tokyo are uh, trying to use this kind of chatbots as well. Uh, they can understand your voice. They can actually understand what you are trying to do and they are trying to uh, assist you on what you are do doing with your telephone banking. Which is quite impressive. Moving on to our next field, we have artificial intelligence in agriculture. Now here's an alarming fact. The world will need to produce 50% more food by 2050 because we're literally eating up everything. The only way this can be possible is if we use resources more carefully. With that being said, artificial intelligence can help farmers get more from the land while using resources more sustainably. Blue River Technology has developed a robot called Sea and Spray, which uses computer vision technologies like object detection to monitor and precisely spray weedicide on cotton plants. So agriculture is actually another field 
var videosu artificial intelligence image processing and uh, sensor monitoring internet of things uh, very popular technologies so let's say you have a farm uh, you are trying to grow for example uh, beans or something else first of all you need to uh, know how much water you need how much fertilizer you need whether uh, you need uh, pesticides uh, for bugs so you can do this automatically with artificial intelligence with the help of robots and drones and this speed up your uh, process and increases your efficiency in farming industry precision spraying can help prevent herbicide resistance apart from this the berlin based agriculture tech startup called peat has developed an application called plantix this is an interesting application as well. You just take a photo of your plant, uh, the leaves of, leaves of your plant, and uh, send it to a web service, and it analyzes the picture and tells you what's the problem with your plant or what might be the problem with your plant. This is applied in uh, medicine, medical field as well. Uh, for example, for skin cancer, you just take a photo of uh, the mark on your skin and then you send it to a web service and it analyzes it and it says uh, whether there's a problem or there's a potential skin cancer or not. Nutrient deficiencies in soil by using images. The image recognition app identifies possible defects through images captured by the user's smartphone camera. Users are then provided with soil restoration techniques, tips, and other possible solutions. The company claims that its software can achieve pattern detection with an estimated accuracy of up to 95%. So the next field we're going to talk about is artificial intelligence in healthcare. When it comes to saving our lives, a lot of organizations and medical care centers are relying on AI. There are many examples of how AI in healthcare has helped patients all over the world. IBM's Watson for Health is helping healthcare organizations apply cognitive technology to unlock vast amounts of health data and power diagnosis. IBM has also developed AI software specifically for medicine. More than 230 healthcare organizations worldwide use IBM Watson technology. So IBM Watson is uh, another very important technology in artificial intelligence. What it's doing is it's analyzing the previous data uh, from the patients and then uh, you just describe what the problem of your current patient is and it's either recommending you uh, a treatment or it's uh, recommending you the diagnostics of the patient. Google's DeepMind Health is another such example that is working in partnership with clinics, researchers, and patients to solve real-world healthcare problems. DeepMind has successfully developed a system that can analyze retinal scans and spot symptoms of sight-threatening eye diseases. The technology combines machine learning and systems neuroscience to build powerful general-purpose learning algorithms into neural networks that mimic the human behavior. Finally, we have artificial intelligence in marketing. We all know that marketing is a way to sugarcoat your product in order to attract more customers. We humans are actually quite good at sugarcoating, but what if an algorithm or a bot is built solely for the purpose of marketing a brand or a company? It would do a pretty awesome job. For example, let's consider the recommendations provided by Amazon. It's a known fact that 35% of Amazon's revenue it's generated by its recommendation in so that part is important uh, the recommendation system which looks actually pretty basic that's creating the 35 percent of amazon's full revenue that's a big number amazon makes use of ai and machine learning to recommend products to their customers it uses recommendations as a targeted marketing tool to increase their revenue there are different ways through which Amazon recommends products to you. For example, if you open up Amazon right now, you'll see a few sections like these, right? You'll see something known as your recently viewed items and featured recommendations. Here, Amazon looks at the products that you've been browsing and recommends very similar products to you. 
you'll also see a section like customers who bought this item also bought this here amazon studies the shopping behavior of customers who have a similar shopping trend and displays items that have been purchased together in the past all of this is carried out by using artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms another famous example of recommendation systems is netflix netflix uses machine learning to recommend movies to you based on the data it collects about you such as your browsing history your age your location and so on it is also a known fact that over 75 percent of what you watch is recommended by netflix and what is the logic behind netflix it is machine learning artificial intelligence and deep learning let's explore how artificial intelligence is helping our planet and at last Until now, what we have seen is mostly about uh, text processing or uh, speech processing. Now we will be seeing a couple of examples about image processing. And as I am working on image processing and video processing, some of our lectures we will be using images and uh, videos. So uh, it's important to understand that part of artificial intelligence as well. Uh, so let's see what we can do with image processing and what we can do with uh, artificial intelligence basically what classification is let's say you have a couple of images uh, and you are trying to classify animals for example you teach your artificial system for example the cats the dogs and horses and when you show another image of an animal your system classifies uh, the animal on the image as either cat dog or a horse that's called the image classification problem so there is a problem called object detection. So with the object detection, you find the location of an object inside the image and then you put a label on it. For example, this part is detected as grass mountain. This part of the image is detected as snowy mountain. This is detected as uh, a house. This is detected as a house as well. This is detected as a lake. So classification is much different than object detection so uh, when we say for example classification you classify these houses as for example uh, this looks like a barn i don't know this looks like a cottage this looks like a house you might live in but the object detection problem localizes an object on the image and it puts a label on it Another problem is object tracking. Let's say you detected an object. Let's say we detected this as a car. The tracking problem is detecting this car in the next frame and knowing that the car in the next frame is this car. So. We detect the, for example, motorcycle. But we know that this motorcycle is the same motorcycle like uh, two or three seconds ago. So that's basically the tracking problem. So we have another uh, subject of semantic segmentation. basically the problem uh, that attempts to understand the part of uh, each pixel the role each, play, uh, each pixel uh, takes for example we segment this as a car we, we segment this as a car we segment this 
as well, we segment all these objects as uh, human. So these are basically the semantic objects. That's why it's called semantic segmentation. And we will see another segmentation, which is called instance segmentation, where we say, okay, this is a car, this is a car, this is a human, and this is another human. Most certainly. There is another uh, interesting thing I would like to share with you. There is fake face generation. Seen movies like the recent Captain Marvel or Gemini Man, where Samuel L. Jackson and Will Smith appear to look like they were much younger. This requires hundreds, if not thousands, of hours of work from professionals manually editing the scenes he appeared in. Instead, you could use a simple AI and do it within a few minutes. So you can use an artificial intelligence to, for example, change gender for the face. Indeed, many techniques allow you to add smiles, make you look younger or older, all automatically using AI-based algorithms. They are mostly applied to images since it's much easier, but the same techniques with small tweaks can be applied on videos, which, as you may suspect, is quite promising for the film industry. And by the way, the results you've been seeing were all made using the technique I will discuss in this video. The main problem is that currently, these generated older versions edited images not only seem weird, but when used in a video, will have glitches and artifacts you surely do not want in a million dollar movie. This is because it's much harder to get videos of people than pictures, making it even harder to train such AI models that require so many different examples to understand what to do. This strong data dependency is one of the reasons why current AI is far from human intelligence. This is why researchers like Rotem, Saban and Co It doesn't require anything except the single video you want to edit. And you can add a smile, make you look younger or even older. It even works with animated videos. This is so cool. But what's even better is how they achieve that. But before doing so, let me talk about the sponsor. So this is basically uh, image generation that's specifically face generation and these are all done by uh, generative networks that's going to be the last topic of our course uh, in the last week of our course we will be talking about generative uh, networks what they basically do is actually you define them a task for example uh, you tell them to generate a face from something or uh, you tell them to change a face for example what we have seen uh, in the video we for example took one picture of Obama which is the original image and we changed its gender or uh, what we did is we changed the original face and then we aged the face so these are called generative networks and uh, they are very very popular in artificial intelligence and for today's topics such as chat GPT these are generative networks as well so uh, what GPT actually stands for is generative uh, pre-trained uh, transformers. These three words are actually like each one is one week of uh, course in artificial intelligence uh, actually. But what you should know is the generative networks are used to generate or uh, fake data. So another Artificial intelligence is swarm robotics. So when we say swarm, actually we we actually mean uh, more than one robot or more than two three robots. Uh, so their behavior is very interesting, and uh, we use artificial intelligence to control all these robots. Don't have traffic jams. Hundreds of thousands of ants can walk along narrow lanes in and out of their nest, and the flow doesn't even stop when two ants bump into each other. They all just keep on moving. Scientists have noticed this, and they think that we can learn a thing or two from these tiny Would you increase the sound of the video, please? Other animals that do similar things. Colonies of termites, herds of zebras. Yes, thanks. Ants 
don't have traffic jams. Hundreds of thousands of ants can walk along narrow lanes in and out of their nest, and the flow doesn't even stop when two ants bump into each other. They all just keep on moving. Scientists have noticed this, and they think that we can learn a thing or two from these tiny travelers, and lots of other animals that do similar things. Colonies of termites, herds of zebras, flocks of birds, schools of fish, they all exhibit some kind of swarming behavior, where a group of animals collectively acts as one one big thing. And they can do great things together, like perfectly synchronizing their movements or building huge mounds. Wouldn't it be great if we could get machines to act like that? The science of swarming behavior is inspiring scientists to build robots that in the future might be able to help with everything from building construction to search and rescue missions. The thing that makes swarming behavior so perfect for robotics is that in a swarm, no one member does anything that's too complicated. An animal is just following a few simple rules rules like so that's very important no one is actually doing something very complex in a swarm everyone is just following very simple rules as we discussed in the previous lecture for example if you look at a colony of birds what just they do is they follow two rules keep a distance to the uh, closest bird and just fly straight these are the two rules they follow and then uh, the whole swarm can move to a direction that's pretty similar with the ants as well and that's mostly actually true for most of the swarms they just follow very simple rules and the emerging behavior is very looks like very complex staying the same distance from all of its neighbors. That means you don't need to make the robot super fancy, and you don't need to program each one to tell it exactly what to do. Instead, you just give a bunch of robots the same basic rules, and because of how those rules play out in large numbers, the group will self-organize and figure out how to do whatever complicated thing you want them to do. This is already a reality in today's robotics. In 2014, we told you about some researchers at Harvard who made over a thousand robots that could arrange themselves into almost any pattern or shape the scientists wanted. The scientists never told any individual robot where to go. Instead, they just gave each one of them the same simple rules to follow, like measure how far you are from your neighbors or find an outer... That's basically it, actually. Two rules, and you can just control as one. Just measure how far you are from your neighbors, find an outer edge of your robot swarm, and move along that edge or just go straight ahead. These are two simple rules. ...edge of your robot swarm and move along that edge. By doing those things over and over, the robots figured out exactly where to go. Those same Harvard engineers also took some inspiration from termites to make robots that could build pyramids, castles, and other structures out of foam blocks. In this case, they borrowed a strategy that termites use known as stigmergy, a method of indirectly communicating with each other to reach a common goal. When humans work on huge construction projects, we need checklists and blueprints and chains of command, and all that involves a lot of direct communication. But termites build by paying attention to tiny clues left over by fellow termites in their environment. When they make mud balls, they add in some pheromones which tells other termites where to build. Each termite is really just doing its own thing, but this indirect form of communication allows them to coordinate their action. So that's the coordination method for the ants. One of them uh, leaves some pheromone just to tell the one coming next where to put the other uh, part of the ball. That's basically it. Very simple rules, but that's creating a swarming behavior. At Harvard, researchers used a similar idea to design robots that could place blocks based on what the structure looked like at the moment. So one robot could put its blocks somewhere that indicated where the robots behind it should put their own blocks down. So they weren't just blindly building because of how they were programmed. Instead, the robots could adapt on the fly, even when the researchers tried to mess with them by moving blocks that robots had previously put down. Each robot placed its block based on how the block that was placed down before it was oriented. These robot swarms are so far confined to labs, but the idea is to eventually have them work for us and solve real-world problems. Some variation of these stigmergic robots might be able to build things in dangerous places like disaster areas or even on Mars. So soon there might be robot swarms all over the place. Which brings us back to to traffic. Scientists have found that car traffic would flow a lot more smoothly if cars acted more like members of swarms. That's actually a very interesting idea. Uh, people were discussing 
when is it going to be safe uh, for self-driving cars to drive and the answer is when everyone uses an automated autonomous car because the autonomous behavior is much faster than our behavior and uh, we cannot follow that as human so either everyone is autonomous or uh, it's very very difficult for the cars to become autonomous with everyone following the same simple rules like staying the same distance from your neighbors and letting nearby cars know what you're doing humans you might have noticed are pretty bad at this some people don't even communicate well enough to use their turn signal and they sit there at the green light because I don't know, what are you doing? Playing Angry Birds? But we could use swarm-based technology to teach self-driving cars to stay the same distance from cars around them, or we could design them so that they periodically let other cars on the road know what they're doing. Like everything with autonomous vehicles, it's all still in the testing and development phase, but the natural logic of swarms might someday be our ticket to less gridlock. Thank you for watching this episode of SciShow, which was brought to you by... Those were the applications of artificial intelligence uh, used in the world. So I would like to share some uh, work from Havasan we do in our uh, image processing, image and video processing group uh, that we use artificial intelligence technology. So as you will see, people uh, are using this technology in the industry and we are using this technology in the industry in Turkey as well. So that's an application uh, for automated speed belt violation detection. We have some images that are coming from number plate recognition cameras and we can automatically detect whether the driver and the passenger are wearing a seatbelt or not. You see some violation examples that were detected automatically. And we can actually detect whether uh, a child is uh, using the front row or not. That's another traffic violation that we can detect automatically as well. So that's our uh, parking lot violation detection system. We use pan tilt zoom cameras in order to uh, monitor the road and if a car parks uh, on a slot that's not supposed to park uh, more than for example two or three minutes then we create an alarm automatically. So this, this is basically using a lot of image processing technology that I have shown you like segmentation, object detection, object classification, feature extraction most of the technology is being used here like uh, we need the number plates as well so we have OCR we have uh, feature extraction, feature tracking object detection like most of the technologies I have shown you we use in this application so we have falling detection as you see we can create whether someone is falling or not automatically so we have fire detection we can use the surveillance cameras in order to detect whether there is fire or not so that's another application of image processing that uses artificial intelligence so you can solve most of these problems with classical image processing uh, which is heavily dependent on mathematics but by using the artificial neural networks you can solve them much more easily and much more uh, robustly and that's video summarization uh, let's say you have a pretty long video and you would like to sort cars for example you would like to sort cars by its color you just would like to see only the gray cars for example so this is called video summarization by using uh, the car's color or you can use the car's for example brand you can just say okay just give me the Hyundai car so this is working like a search engine on a video so you can just say uh, just give me the Peugeot cars or let's say you know actually make a model of the car let's say uh, you would like to just search for VW Passat from 2014 to 2017. So that's an artificial intelligence application we created in Havasan that's using uh, image processing and artificial intelligence technology.
So I would like to share some uh, examples from OpenAI. Most probably you all know uh, what ChatGPT is. Maybe uh, some of you tried this technology uh, beforehand. So as I said, GPT stands for Generative Pre-trained uh, uh, Transformation? Transformer, sorry. Generative uh, Pre-trained Transformer. So ChatGPT is a technology created by OpenAI. Um, actually, most of the stuff I have shown you uh, was either created by uh, either Google or by OpenAI. But ChatGPT is uh, right now very popular. So that's an application uh, I did for you. That's the uh, background from uh, the ChatGPT. So I just wanted the ChatGPT Chat GPT to uh, write an article about recent uh, development or recent advances in artificial intelligence. So I just wanted to create a article or uh, some text. So this is a text created by the chat GPT. So let's read it. Th this is really far beyond what most of the humans can create. So it's basically a very brief, very nice uh, text generated automatically. And this is really good from my experience. And this was just created by an artificial intelligence. So uh, there is another uh, program to create with the chat GPT to uh, create a food recipe. You just give the uh, ingredients. For example, let's say we, we are creating a blood cake uh, with some stupid uh, ingredients. For example, let's say we have an egg. Let's say we have milk. I don't know, we have sugar, for example, and we have chocolate. You just tell the artificial intelligence to create your recipe and it's creating the instructions. I didn't try the recipe, but it looks pretty doable from my point of view. Obviously, they don't guarantee uh, the quality of the recipe, but it, it can create actually a pretty nice recipe. So this is another application. Didn't start. So we will just ask, create an outline uh, for an essay, for example, about recent uh, advances in artificial intelligence. So it's going to give us an outline on uh, what we can talk or what we can write about. For example, say it's you can just uh, start with the definition of artificial intelligence, uh, the machine says, and says uh, you can just write some stuff about overview of recent advances in artificial intelligence technology. You can talk about the uh, history of artificial intelligence. So this is basically the outline I followed uh, in this lecture. I created this slide two days ago, but I created this slide last year. So there was no technology uh, last year when I created the slides. So what it recommended is actually the instructions uh, or the outline I'm using uh, for this lecture. So it's pretty, pretty good. And this is another technology from uh, Google that's called Imagen. Here you define uh, some stuff, for example, uh, a bicycle on top of a boat. And it's creating you a video. It can either create you a video or uh, an image. For example, a teddy bear, uh, a shiny golden waterfall flowing, uh, a British shorter jumping, for example. So you should try them uh, just to see what you can achieve with artificial intelligence nowadays. A teddy bear running in New York City, for example. That's, that's a generated video. And those are all generated by uh, generative networks. That's all. 
some theoretical background of machine learning. So what we see here in the slide is we have some uh, technologies in machine learning. The first one is unsupervised learning. Uh, we have supervised learning and we have reinforcement learning. So uh, we will be starting with uh, unsupervised unsup learning. And supervised learning means you have some training data and uh, you create a mathematical model and you use your training data in order to uh, tune the parameters or find the parameters of your mathematical model and then you solve two problems. One is classification problem and the other one is regression problem. For the classification, uh, let's say uh, you have a couple of objects you have pens and, uh, for example, pencils. The classification means you separate pens from the class, uh, pencils. And the regression means you have some data and you need to predict some values from your existing data. That's called regression. We will spend the first month actually uh, with regression and classification. That's supervised learning. So the important thing is, uh, the important thing you need to remember is we have some training data. We use this training data to predict some parameters or tune some parameters of our mathematical model. That's called supervised learning. That's one branch of machine learning. The other branch of machine learning is unsupervised learning. There you don't train your system uh, with the data. Uh, you have some data and you do some mathematical analysis. For example, uh, you find some clusters on your data or uh, you use dimensionality reduction to reduce the dimension of your data uh, guys one of you has a microphone switched on can you please switch that off when you don't speak it's creating some white noise uh, so the second branch we will be talking about uh, in our lecture is unsupervised learning uh, and there we will be talking about dimensionality reduction and uh, clustering. We will spend some time. And there is reinforcement learning. We will not uh, putting any time in this course into reinforcement learning. But reinforcement learning you can uh, think as learning by itself. That's like learning how to walk. You try to walk. You make a mistake. You learn from your mistakes and uh, you optimize your walking. And then you try again and try again. And that's a loop and uh, until you reach your goal uh, you try and try and you learn from your mistakes that's basically what reinforcement learning is that's mostly being used in uh, robotics uh, and unsupervised learning is mostly being used uh, in data science unsupervised learning is used almost everywhere Okay, so uh, that's an important slide. So the, here you see the languages uh, used in machine learning. The most popular language that we use in uh, machine learning is Python. And interestingly, there is Java and then comes C++ and R. R is pretty popular. Uh, actually, people usually used to use R for data science but right now python is like the standard in uh, machine learning and i really expect you to at least understand python code you should be able to write some python code in order to uh, make the homework so those are the technologies uh, that we use in machine learning we basically use python uh, on uh, bottom of that we use spark tensorflow uh, pytorch uh, keras r Sometimes we use uh, scikit-learn. Most of this technology we will be uh, using in the lecture. And those are the companies that usually develop artificial intelligence. Maybe I should have uh, add OpenAI uh, to this list. There is Google that's mostly responsible from TensorFlow. Uh, there is Amazon uh, ABS. Uh, there is Microsoft uh, putting a lot of money, putting a lot of investment on artificial artificial intelligence uh, 
Facebook is funding quite some money on artificial intelligence as well. Uh, and most of these companies create the frameworks we use uh, for deep learning development. Data science. Um, so there's that's not a big buzz actually. Data, data science is the field of study that combines uh, some domain expertise, programming skills and knowledge, uh, mathematics and statistics, statistics to extract meaningful insight from the data. So in short, data science is the science that deals with data and uses some uh, mathematical tools, statistical tools, uh, domain expertise and programming skills in order to get meaningful insights from the data. So on the left side, you see some disciplines that, that the data scientists should know. Actually, you need to know some software. You don't need to be a software engineer in order to uh, have a data science experience, but it's really good to know uh, programming. You need some mathematics That's that you really need. It's impossible to deal with artificial intelligence without knowing mathematics. You don't need to be an expert in mathematics, but uh, you will need to remember some uh, stuff from linear algebra, differential equations, and uh, calculus. This course is not going to be a very theoretical course. I will explain the theoretical background uh, in each lecture, but it's going to be more uh, practical. So we will try to uh, make the examples together. Uh, I'm not sure how it's going to work with this online stuff, but we will try to make it together. And, uh, you will have both theoretical knowledge, maybe not so deep, but you will have some hands-on training uh, after this course. So some skills that a data scientist must have, you need some mathematical and statistics uh, skills in order to understand the machine learning and statistical uh, modeling stuff. You need some domain knowledge uh, in whichever industry you, you work for, you need some domain knowledge in order to uh, become a good data scientist. You really need some programming skills and database uh, expertise and uh, you need some communication and visualization uh, skills. You need to be able to read charts. That's one thing you really need to be able to do. Okay, so let's take a look at the course curriculum again. Uh, and I will be explaining what I mean with uh, each of this stuff in the incoming slides. At the end of the course, you will be able to analyze data. So that was one requirement uh, of being a good data scientist. You will be able to plot certain graphs. Uh, you will be able to choose the right model for your problem. That's an important uh, aspect. You will be able to understand the fundamental mathematics behind machine learning. As I said, the course is not going to be very theoretical. I will just show you the explanation of the mathematical model. You will not be responsible from this mathematics uh, in the exams or in the homework. But in order to understand what's going on in the background, it's a good idea to uh, pay attention to the mathematics of the uh, course. And you will uh, grasp some neural network expertise and you will be able to use Python. So first we will be seeing uh, regression and classification uh, problem. So what I mean with classification is you have classes and you have circles. Classification is the operation to find this border that separates the pluses from the circles. That's called classification. You can have more than two pluses for the classification problem. Uh, but the basic classification definition is you try to find the border that separates these two different classes in the best way. Sometimes you cannot separate them perfectly. Sometimes the classes uh, are in between each other, but that's to find trying to find the best separating border between these two classes. So that's the classification problem. And uh, the regression problem is you have these dots. Let's say this is the x coordinate of the dot, this is the y coordinate of the dot. 
and I assume someone asked if there was a dot whose x coordinate is this, what would be the y coordinate of that dot? So the regression problem is to use your data in order to create a model so that when another uh, data comes in, you can predict the outcome of that data. For example, this looks like a line, right? So if I have an x coordinate here, I'm pretty sure the y coordinate is going to be somewhere here because it's close to the line that's passing through most of that lines. So that's the regression problem. So we will spend three weeks on regression and classification. Then in the fifth week, we will take a look at the support vector machines. So this is another classification problem. And as I said, the classification is trying to find the best border that's separating these two distinct classes. And in the previous example, we have a line that can actually separate the two classes. But your problem might be more complex than that. So a line, for example, this line or here, is not capable of separating this class from this class, right? Then you need a more complex border, which is this hyperplane. So support vector machine machines are used to classify complex data that cannot be solved linearly. And then in the sixth week, we will see the decision trees. A decision tree, by its, uh, as the name suggests, you have a tree and uh, you make some decisions depending on uh, the answers of uh, the questions of the nodes. For example, let's say you would like to uh, decline or uh, accept an offer. You have a decision tree. You say uh, you have a salary at least $50,000. If it is no, then you decline the offer. If it is yes, th these are predefined rules. Uh, then you check another note. These small things are called notes. You have a commit more than one hour. Uh, if it is uh, yes, then you decline the offer. If it is no, you uh, keep going. And th the decision trees are uh, being used for using simple rules in order to make a decision. And in the sixth week, we will be dealing with the decision tree. And then we will start working on the uh, unsupervised learning. Uh, for sixth week, we will be dealing with supervised learning. And then we will start with the unsupervised learning. We will have key nearest neighborhood. Uh, and we will be uh, dealing with dimensionality reduction problems and uh, clustering problems. What clustering means is you try to create clusters of the objects that are similar to each other. For example, here we try to find uh, three clusters, uh, the diagonals, the circles, and then rectangles. So this is called the clustering problem. We will be dealing with this in the seventh week. And in the eighth week, we will be seeing ensemble learning bagging and boosting. Uh, what ensemble learning is, you have uh, some mathematical models, let's say, weak mathematical models, and you combine them to create a better mathematical model. That's basically called ensemble learning. That's basically combining some uh, weak uh, learners in order to create a better learner or a better predictor. And in the ninth week, uh, we will be looking at the clustering problem. Again, the clustering problem, what we have seen in the previous slide, uh, is trying to find the clusters. Uh, but not with different objects, but uh, with respect to their uh, distance. And in the 10th week, we will be uh, dealing with the genetic algorithms. Genetic algorithms are the algorithms uh, that are inspired by the nature so there are some problems you cannot solve in a brute force manner for example the traveling salesman problem uh, there are so many combinations uh, that would take so much time if you try to solve them uh, in a brute force way that's called uh, the greedy way 
So you need to use genetic algorithms in order to make a prediction or a uh, approximation. Uh, so in the tenth week we will be dealing with the genetic algorithms and we will be uh, working on uh, zero one knapsack problem and uh, traveling salesman problem. And from the eleventh week we will start uh, working on the deep learning problems. We will uh, see the basics of neural network. What a neuron is, uh, what are hidden layers, output layers, and input layers. That's going to be a very brief introduction into the uh, neural network and deep network, uh, deep learning problems. And in the 12th week, we will uh, start dealing with the deep learning and uh, convolutional neural networks we will be uh, working on in the 12th week. In the 13th week, uh, I will be talking about convolutional neural networks. That's a deep learning problem, uh, but that's specifically designed for uh, image processing. There you will uh, understand some basics of image processing and some basics of convolutional neural network. And in the last week, we will be dealing with uh, generative networks. I actually try to explain the generative networks in the lecture. Uh, that's basically uh, getting some random noise. There is a generate, generator part uh, and there is a discriminator part. So the generator part is uh, faking an image as it was like the fake face, face generation. And the discriminator part is trying to uh, discriminate whether the given image is a fake image or a real image. So these are called generative networks. Uh, most of the stuff I showing you, like the chat GPT, uh, that's a transform network that's used for uh, neural network processing, but the generative network, this generated discriminator uh, couple is being used for uh, generation problems in artificial intelligence. So that's basically the uh, course outline and what we will be seeing for the rest of the course. Do you have any questions? Until now. Yeah, okay. Okay then. Uh, so for the next week, we will start uh, both programming and uh, the regression problem. We will be seeing linear regression. So what we will uh, be solving is we will have these points and we will create some uh, line with these points and then we will try to predict for example the current uh, current voltage problem this is called let's say we have a current uh, here what would be the voltage so that's going to be pr the problem we will be solving uh, next week so I would like you to take a look at uh, some of the technologies so that uh, you may actually want to follow uh, with your computer next week so please try to sharpen your knowledge about Python. Uh, try to take a look at Pandas. Try to install Anaconda. Uh, Anaconda is an environment that's uh, created for uh, Python. Basically, just installing Python will not be sufficient because you will need a lot of libraries and installing uh, Python libraries without Anaconda, especially on Windows, is a very painful process. You will need to create some virtual environments uh, and install some libraries like Pandas, Seaborn, uh, Matplotlib. We will take a look at all these technologies uh, next week. But if you uh, try to sharpen your knowledge about these technologies until next week, that would be pretty good. And please try this. Uh, if you can do this, that's going to be pretty good. If you cannot, uh, then we will try to make this together uh, next week. First, try to install Anaconda. You don't need to know what Anaconda is, but just take a brief look at Anaconda. Try to create a virtual environment. Uh, try to install Jupyter Notebook and Pandas, NumPy, and Seaborn. Uh, these are the libraries we will be using for uh, the next lecture. If you cannot install them, don't worry. I will be showing them how uh, showing how to install them 
next week but uh, if you want to follow uh, the next week course uh, with your computer and with your environment try to install this stuff if you cannot install just email me and i will try to help you